Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning, whether you are joining us here in the sanctuary or uh, tuning in via Zoom. Uh, we appreciate you being here and uh, want you to feel very welcome. Our call to worship today comes from Romans chapter 13, where Paul says, And do this, understanding the time, the hour has come for you to wake up. Our call this morning is to wake up. All right. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber, for your salvation is nearer than you think. It is nearer than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. Put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. What a call, that we might worship and that we might live clothed with our Lord Jesus Christ. Would you stand and join us in song?
Pray with me. Lord, help us to sing. Help us to sing of your love forever. Help us to dance. Help us to share that love forever. Help us to shine because we were filled with you. Help us to sing. And forgive us when we don't, Lord, when we forget who you are and what you have done in our lives and how you have healed us and set us free. And help us when we can't sing, when we need healing, emotional healing, physical healing, spiritual healing. Be our healer, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. A few things that draw to your attention as we come together as God's people today. First of all, I want to turn the clock back just a little bit. Uh, Friday we had a blood drive here. We collected 40 units of blood, so thanks again to all those who have uh, helped out with that, uh, who have served, and also who have given blood. It's one of those ways that we uh, minister to our community. Uh, turn the clock back, um, well, one day and 68 years. Uh, yesterday was Ken and uh, Barb Stringholt's 68th an wedding anniversary. And, uh,
Uh, Barb has the distinction of being our member here who's been here her whole life. That's the oldest. So, um, so we give, give her the floor every once in a while to uh, <coughs> say some wonderful things. Like it was 68 years ago yesterday that you were married right here in this spot, in this sanctuary. Uh, during that last song, I was doing some mental calculation to see if you got married in this sanctuary or in the old building, but it was in this, this one, right? This one. This one. After this was built like 1950 and you got married in 1954, so... Yes. And then uh, I did do this rewrite of the story for the little the little kids. Yes. Uh, in there when we were together. Yes, yes. In the old the old building that was next door before this one was built. Right. Yes. Yeah. You go way back. You remember things that none of us remember. Yeah. You've forgotten things that none of us even knew about. So. <laughs> Great opportunity to celebrate, so thank you. Um, as we walk along through life, there are people that we want to remember who have passed on before us. Um, next Sunday is our Memorial Day uh, celebration. We'll have memorial geraniums up front. If you'd still like to give one in memory of someone, today is the last day to take one of those envelopes and uh, turn that in. We'll be happy to mark those memories uh, next week as well. Today, we have a congregational meeting uh, immediately following worship service. We're going to gather over in the uh, gathering place. You can get your cup of coffee and a cookie and uh, find a place to sit down. Uh, we will have uh, someone uh, uh, in charge in the, uh, uh, in the gym, in the ARC, uh, for kids elementary school age that uh, need a spot to go uh, while that is happening. So the, the uh, ARC will be uh, attended to. So if parents, you can feel comfortable sending your kids there during that time. I um, invite uh, any of those of you who are guests who are not members of uh, the church here are welcome to come and observe that particular meeting. We're going to be selecting elders and deacons. We're going to talk about uh, church finances and, and uh, where we're going from here, all of those kinds of things in our congregational meeting. Um, it's time for that uh, this, this year. So also looking ahead, um, our Vacation Bible School is coming up. Uh, spots still. We can have many more volunteers to help out in a variety of ways. I don't know if you realize this, but this year Park Church is not uh, partnering with us to do VBS. They've got something going on with middle school students that particular week, and so they're doing their thing and we're doing ours. And so we'd love to have as many people as possible come and uh, be a part of serving uh, for, um, for Vacation Bible School. Get those kids uh, <clears throat> signed up. There are cards on the, the tables in, uh, in the entryway. If you have friends and relatives you want to encourage to sign up as well. And uh, we're getting prepared for that June uh, 20 through 23. Um, next Sunday, when we gather in worship, we're having a, a, a choir help to sing the hymns for the service, and next Sunday, we are going to practice ahead of time for that, so if you'd like to be part of that choir, come at 9.30, we'll give you the music uh, for those songs, Ruth will be here, and we'll run through those together. Um, our mission as a church, we're reminding ourselves of that uh, all the way through this, uh, uh, through this month of May, is to be crossing boundaries in Jesus' love. Uh, to meet needs, build relationships, and grow disciples. And a couple of the values that we have as we live into that are acceptance and authenticity, uh, that when we come together, we work at welcoming people to come in, that we're not, not quick to judge and to say um, uh, people don't belong or shouldn't be in this place. We want people to come to here, to worship on Wednesday nights, to different programs and ministries we have to hear the, the good news of Jesus Christ. And we, we do a good job of, of welcoming people in in that way. And then we also want to live with authenticity, that we are seeking to be people who are genuine and, and humble and honest uh, with one another as we walk and live together in life and ministry. And so we're seeking to, to live out those values as we, as we walk and live together as God's people. So let's uh, come before God in prayer today. Lord God, we give you thanks uh, for the way in which you have called us together to be your people in this place. I just want to give you thanks uh, for, for Ken and Barb and for the history that that reminds us of that we have in this spot, of, of generations of people who have been a part of ministry in this particular location, who have continued to show the good news of Jesus Christ, who have been the, the physical presence, the visible presence of Christ in this community. And we thank you for the way that we get to live that out here and now. I want to give you thanks for the ways in which we can live into that day by day, and we thank you for opportunities that we have to cross boundaries in doing that. 
Lord, there are people in our lives that uh, need to know more about you or, or need to be cared for or to be, have relationships built. And, and we ask that you'd help us to take those steps of crossing boundaries to, to connect with people around us because we want to share your love. We want people to know uh, the love of Jesus Christ and his, his presence and his power within this world. <clears throat> and we ask that you take um, your love that is in us and enable us to share that with people that we work with, that we live near, that are surrounding us here in this community. Pray that, uh, that people who see us, who know us, who experience us might know that it's the love of Jesus Christ that flows through us. And we give you thanks for opportunities we have to meet needs within this community. I give you thanks for a, for a micro pantry out front where someone can stop and they're, they're needing just something to help get them through a particular week uh, where there's not enough money to get all the groceries that they need. And, and this church very willingly shares uh, items that, uh, that they can take. And we ask that you would continue to bless that ministry and others that we do as well that are meeting needs within this community. We thank you for opportunities to build relationships, to, to have connections that are deep and authentic and, and uh, welcoming of people into our lives, you know, that people might know and experience your love in deeper and deeper ways. Lord, we don't want relationships that are just shallow, where we just are acquaintances and just say hello to one another, but we want to be people who grow deep in relationship with one another and with the people that you place around us so that they might know the fullness of Christ in us and through us and uh, the fullness of your love that could come to them. And then, Lord, we also want to grow as disciples. We want to, to know more and more of what it looks like to, to, to know Jesus and to walk with Jesus and to serve Jesus within this world. Um, we are constantly challenged by, uh, by what goes on around us in this world. The, the circumstances change, the, the politics around us changes, the, the needs of our community change, but, but the message of Jesus Christ and his presence here is the same. But we, we need to learn and to understand how do we live it out today? in ways that are concrete, ways that are relevant, uh, ways that connect with the people who are around us. And so teach us, uh, guide us, direct us, because we want to grow up as your people in this place, growing deeper in relationship with you, better able to live out our relationship with you and with people around us. May you be honored and glorified as we seek to live as your people in this place. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. stand with us as we continue to worship this morning.
sentence bow in reverence, so will I. If the oceans roar your brightness, so will I. For everything exists to lift you high, so will I. If the wind goes where you send it, so will I. We worship you this morning for all that you are, all that you've done, all that you are yet to do. That image of the lost sheep, you left the 99 to go off and after the one. This love, this grace that we don't deserve that you have on offer for us. We thank you, we worship you. Jesus, it's in your name that we pray. Amen. We're going to take the next three and a half minutes, greet those around you, grab some coffee. Kids, we're going to sing another song so you can hang out for the next song as well.
I'm going to ask you to stand one more time. This one's too good to not stand for. Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. The engulfing waters threatened me, the deep surrounded me. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. I want to say thank you for, uh, for singing the song uh, this morning, choosing the song, So Will I. Um, as we went through the words of that song, there's just so many times I thought that's, that's exactly what we need to be doing uh, from the passage of Scripture that we have today and what God calls us to do as His people. 
as we live out our relationship with one another and with him within this world. Uh, today is our congregational meeting. It's a congregational meeting Sunday, and so we want to do some thinking about what it looks like to be the church of Jesus Christ in this place and time. And of course, we're walking through the book of Jonah, and Jonah is all about um, God's desire to have his people bring the good news uh, to people around them in their world. And of course, Jonah has a hard time uh, getting himself going to Nineveh to bring the good news there, but God brings his grace, his mercy to those people uh, after Jonah speaks. And so it becomes a, a, perhaps a model of some kind for us. In fact, there are three things that we want to look at this morning from just three verses of Scripture at the beginning of chapter 3. We want to think about God's servant, God's city, and then God's word. And all three of those things are mentioned in those first three verses of Jonah, chapter 3. Hear the word of God. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to journey through it. So chapter 3 begins with our servant. So God's servant, Jonah, is mentioned again at the beginning of chapter 3. Um, Jonah has been a very reluctant servant of God. We know the story of how Jonah, the first time God speaks to him, Jonah heads the opposite direction, gets on a boat in Joppa, heads to Tarshish, as far away from Nineveh as he could possibly get in the world as he knows it at that time. Uh, God sends a great storm and a great fish to bring Jonah back, uh, to head him in the right direction, and now Jonah hears the word of God again, and this time uh, Jonah responds differently. But Jonah is sort of the model from Scripture being the reluctant servant of God, not wanting to do what God wants him to do, and being hesitant to obey. But if you look through Scripture, you discover that Jonah isn't the only reluctant servant of God in Scripture. There are a lot of servants of God that uh, when God first comes to them with a task, that they um, balk at what it is that God wants them to do. They say, oh God, I really can't do that. You go all the way back to Moses. Uh, Moses at the burning bush, God wants him to go to Egypt to talk to Pharaoh, to bring his people out. Five times Jonah, or Moses said to God, I can't do that task. I can't speak well. I don't know your name. Uh, the final one, he just, just says, just send somebody else. Don't make me do it. Send someone else. And God finally says, Moses, just get going and do it. Five times Moses said no. Then there's Gideon. Remember, Gideon led the, the, uh, you know, the 300 soldiers against the whole armies of Midian, was victorious, delivered his people. Do you know that when Gideon first heard from God, the first thing that Gideon said to God was, I need a sign. Give me some miraculous sign that proves to me that this is really God that's speaking to me and not the burrito I had for dinner last night. He wanted some kind of a physical sign that, that, uh, that, that it was God that was talking. And then God, he finally realized that it is God, but then God gives him a task to do. And instead of doing the task in the daylight so everyone can see it and learn from it, he does it in the dark of night when no one else is around. And then when God tells him he's going to lead the army, he still doesn't want to obey God or completely trust God until he lays the fleece out twice. First, he wants the fleece to be wet and the ground dry, and then he wants the ground to be wet and the fleece to be dry. He's got to do it two times before he'll even begin to obey God and to step out to lead the army. Gideon was a very reluctant servant of God. Or you think of the prophet Elijah. You know, he did that great thing up on Mount Carmel where he calls down fire from God on the sacrifice and they, you know, they put to death of the, all the prophets of Baal and there's been this great um, proof of God's, that God is God. And you think that Elijah would be on, on cloud nine because now he's proved to all the people who God is because, because God, their God, answered with fire. But Elijah hears that Queen Jezebel wants him dead. And so he runs away. He heads off into the wilderness and finally ends up down at Mount Sinai. Um, and there he talks to God. He says, God, I am the only one left in Israel who loves you. I'm the only one left in Israel who believes in you anymore. Just let me die. My purpose is done. But God says, Elijah, you need to get back to work. Because there's still 7,000 people in Israel that haven't bowed the knee to any other God than me. You've got leaders to appoint. You've got someone to follow you, um, follow after you that needs to be trained. Elijah, get back to work. Elijah, even in the middle of his task, was a reluctant prophet. We see the prophet Jeremiah. When God comes to Jeremiah and gives him the task, Jeremiah says, I'm too young. I can't possibly speak. I'm too young. 
And God has to tell him he's got to get going because he's got a message for him. Later on in Jeremiah's ministry, Jeremiah says, whenever God gives me these hard words to speak to the people, I, I try to hold them in my heart and my, in my mouth and not speak them to others, but they become a burning fire, and I just can't hold them there. It's as though God is forcing his words out of a reluctant prophet, Jeremiah, to the people of God. Jonah is not the only reluctant prophet, the only reluctant servant of God. He's just part of a long line of reluctant servants. So we could go all the way through the, the New Testament as well and see how that much shaping <coughs> excuse me, needs to go on before people become the people of God, the leaders that they need to be. But we discover that not only is he reluctant, he becomes obedient. If we get into verse 3, it says, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. You know, verse 3 in chapter 3 begins with the same two words as verse 3 in chapter 1. Both of them say, Jonah arose. Jonah got up. And so we don't know until the third word of the sentence in the Hebrew whether he's doing the right thing or the wrong thing. Because the first time in chapter 1, he arose and he went to Joppa. Now in chapter 3, he arises he obeys the word of God. He finally does what God calls him to do because God sort of got him penned in. He knows that God could command the storm and the sea creatures to, to get him where he needs to be. So Jonah says, okay, God, I'll do what I have to do. And he's obedient finally, and he goes uh, to the land of Nineveh. And notice that when he is in Nineveh, he is influential in bringing about some change and transformation <clears throat> among the people there. We don't see he's got just a... Uh, a short message that he gives to them. It says, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. He gives them the very brief message, but God uses that message to bring about transformation. You know, we don't know if this is Jonah's only message or if it's just a, a short piece of the message that he proclaimed. There's one commentator that's actually suggested that, that Jonah even tries to sabotage his work by giving such an obscure message to the people. It just goes around saying these few words, Yet 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. Yet 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. But whatever it is that Jonah does, it brings about change among those people. Because God uses that incident of Jonah walking through the streets of Nineveh and saying, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed to get the people of Nineveh to think about who they are, how they have been living, and a transformation that needs to come. So this reluctant servant of God finally becomes obedient, and when he is obedient, he's influential among the people that he has sent to bring the word of God to. And isn't that how God often has to work with us as we go about doing the tasks that we need to do within this world? That we are so often reluctant servants of God, that, that we sense the Spirit leading us, or we hear an invitation to be a part of something like vacation Bible school, or to serve on a consistory, or to be a shepherding elder, or to, to go next door to our neighbor when we hear that they, they're struggling with something, and, and our immediate response is, you know, I'm not qualified, I'm too busy, send somebody else, I don't have the right gifts, I don't want to do it. I might embarrass myself. We, we come up with all of our things that can hold us at arm's length from the task of God. But when we are willing to be obedient, to step into what it is that God's calling us to do, we see the opportunity for great influence to happen. Because God wants to live out um, his love in and through us into this world in very concrete and tangible ways. And so he has to do it through people. We, there is no other plan that God has for bringing his love to this world than by sending people uh, into the world with his good news. And so even when we are reluctant and hesitant and unsure, we need to step forward in obedience to have that influence that God wants us to have in this world. You know, one of the things that we have, have put together recently is, there, is our new, is our kind of a revising our mission statement. It always revolves around the same kinds of things, but the mission that we have is that we are crossing boundaries in Jesus' love to meet needs, build relationships, and make disciples. Um, we've, uh, I had uh, Jessica this week printed up on little cards because I want everyone to, to have one of these cards. Take it home. Um, so we'll send them around this side, and Max is sending them around that way. Um, oh, people at the sound table up there, you'll have to grab one later. But uh, take one, put it someplace where you're going to run across it uh, day after day, in the mirror, uh, whatever, whatever it needs to be, crossing boundaries in Jesus' love to meet needs, build relationships, and make disciples. 
God is calling us to be his servants uh, in this community, in the places where we are, in our workplaces, uh, in our living places, in our family relationships, in our schools. Um, crossing boundaries is a term that we've used many times over the past several years. And it calls us to just take one step beyond where we've been comfortable before, to, uh, to talk to someone that we haven't talked to before, to ask a little bit deeper question than what we've asked before. Uh, to care in a way that we may not have cared before, but to cross the boundary with the love of Jesus Christ that we've experienced so that it might be shared in this world as we meet needs, build relationships, and grow disciples. Simply being called to take that love of Christ out into the world uh, where he's called us to live and to be as his people. Because you see, God loves people around us. We move from God's servant to God's city. In this particular case, the city is the city of Nineveh. And the city of Nineveh, God's city here, is a, a city that is a great city. Listen to all the words that are spoken about Nineveh. Verse 2, he says, go to the great city of Nineveh. And then verse 3, now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Nineveh is a great city. It's used over and over again. That word great is used 14 times in the book of Jonah. It's a describes some big things that are, that are happening uh, all the way through the book. And one of the biggest things is this city of Nineveh. There's 120,000 people living in the city of Nineveh. It's a great city of its time, um, a large city, uh, many people who are there. Later on, it's going to become the capital city of the Assyrian uh, Empire. Um, it is a great city. But there's a, an interesting phrase here that we only know if we look at the Hebrew. Um, in uh, the second part of verse 3, it says, Now Nineveh was a very large city. But in the Hebrew, it says that it is an Elohim city. Now Elohim is a word that's used for God. It's sometimes used to describe God, the same as we would use the word Yahweh. Uh, the personal name of God is very directly, um, it's God. God is known by that term. Sometimes the word Elohim is just used, used of gods in general. Um, all, the, all of the gods, sometimes it's used of heavenly beings and, and things that are above this earth, uh, that all of those carry that name Elohim. And so you kind of kind of tell from context what it is that's being talked about um, when that word Elohim is used. But Nineveh is an Elohim city. So what can that possibly mean? And notice it doesn't really translate into our English very well. It could mean that, El that uh, Nineveh is a very religious city. That it's a city where there are lots of gods, that they have lots of religious things going on, and some, uh, some commentators think that that's the case. Other commentators think that it just simply means that it's a, it's a god-sized city. It's sort of like a supersized city. Instead of being a human city or a big human city, it's a god-sized city because it's so much bigger than any of the cities that, that people know of in the land of Israel. So it's a god-sized city, and that's the, that's the avenue that most translators take. And that's why it says, now, Nineveh was a very large city. But really putting the word Elohim there tells us that Nineveh is an important city to God. It's a significant city to God. The city means something to God. It's significant to our God. And that's why God is sending Jonah there. He cares about the people of the city of Nineveh. He loves them. And he wants his message to get to those particular people. Even though they happen to be the enemy of the Israelites at this particular time, in the previous generation that came and wrecked havoc on the neighbors of the Israelites, and another generation later, the city, people of Nineveh are actually going to come and destroy the northern kingdom of Israel. But this people is important to God. In fact, we're going to take a little sneak over to chapter 4. The very last verse of the book of Jonah says this. Where God says to Jonah, And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? That God simply loves Nineveh. It's a great city. It's a city of significance to God, and he wants his message to go there. And of course, in the scheme of the whole book of Jonah, it says the people of God being sent to their very enemies with the good news of God's love and forgiveness. And when the message of God's love comes there, first um, as a message of, um, of, of destruction, it brings about transformation for those people. 
that uh, as they hear the word of God for them, they begin to be changed and transformed and uh, in something that, that begins to resemble what God is and what God is like. God cares about them, and he wants to have their city changed. We live in the midst of a community of people, and God loves this city. He doesn't love Holland, Zealand, Hamilton more than in any other city around in the world, but he loves the, the place where we love, live. He loves, the, he loves the city. I know each of us have our own favorites in terms of, you know, maybe we love the city of Holland, or maybe we love the city of Zealand, or we love the city of Saugatuck, or we love living out in the country where we're not a part of any particular city, or, or maybe there's something else that the place is the place that we love. But God loves the city. God loves a place where people are rubbing shoulders with one another, where they're figuring out how to live life in the midst of the challenges of life in their times. And so we're called upon to love the city that God loves. This whole region where God has placed us is a place where he calls us to love as he has loved, to show Jesus' love to this place. One of the things that uh, we did as a part of thinking about you know, reworking our mission statement and values and all that was to, to ask for an insight report. Now, an insight report is sort of a, 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 it's a data set about the area within which we live. So it, it drew a circle of a mile radius around our church here and said, what are the characteristics of the community within which we live? Um, what are some things that we need to know as we seek to minister in this place? Now, we did the same thing nine years ago when I was here. We drew that same circle and asked the same kinds of questions. And one of the things that came to the surface nine years ago was that this area around the church here was what was known as an aging in place neighborhood. That as people were growing older, their kids would you know, graduate from high school, they would go off to college, and they would go other places, and people would stay in this community, and they would age in place. That was the main characteristic of this community. But now, nine years later, things have changed. The, the, the characteristics of this community now are that we are having more young families. In fact, the fastest growing group expected over the next 10 years is zero to four-year-olds. That that is the fastest growing group of people within this community expected over the next 10 years. And another one of those high ones is, is people in their ages 25 to 34, so these are the parents of those kids. So notice what's happening, that those homes that had been aging in place are now turning over, and there are younger families that are, that are purchasing those homes. And so we are living in this neighborhood, this community, ministering in a community at this time where there's going to be more and more children who are coming up, and young families that are looking for ways to, to live as a, as a, in a healthy place and to, to live out their relationship with God and with one another. And we have the opportunity to live in this community, to minister in this community in a way which brings transformation as we live here as a people of God, because God loves this community. God loves the broader community that we're part of. He loves this neighborhood, and he wants the people here to be transformed, and so he lives that out through us as we seek to live and serve and minister here. Finally, we think about God's word. What is God's word? Uh, for in the passage, he says, go to the city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you, the word that God is giving. It's first of all, a word about design, a word of design. You see, God's word to, to Jonah in this passage was to proclaim the message I give you. Chapter one, he said, preach against the city because its wickedness has come up before me. And so the initial word that, that Jonah is to give to the people is that they are not living according to the design that God has for human flourishing. That uh, the people of Nineveh are wicked, the people are violent, and, even, and they're doing that as they go and conquer other peoples around them, but they're, they're also living in that way with one another, and that kind of a lifestyle cannot be sustained. That they're going to destroy themselves from the inside out, and it does not fit within the design pattern that God has for people to flourish within this world. You see, God wants cities to flourish, and he wants neighborhoods to flourish, and he wants um, families to flourish, and he wants schools to flourish, and all of those designs are things that God has given to us within this world. And so he's sending Jonah to the city of Nineveh to say there's wickedness and there's violence, and something needs to change, or you will destroy yourselves. You will be destroyed by the very things that you are doing. You'll be overturned, overthrown. And so as they hear that, last week we discovered that they went through all of the steps of, of repentance, 
of being humble before God, and then they also change their ways. They stopped their wickedness, they stopped their violence, and God saw that they had changed their ways. They're beginning to live more according to his design for human flourishing. You see, God wanted to show grace to the people of Nineveh. He wanted them to experience um, his mercy. And that is what God wants to do in our world today. He doesn't come into our world in order to condemn the world, to destroy the world, to overturn the world. He wants to save the world from its, the path that it's on, the ways in which by our own living we're going to destroy ourselves. The natural consequences of choices and decisions that are made. He wants to show his grace. He's a God of love and mercy. He wants her to be flourishing in wholeness. And so he sends his servants. He sends his grace as well. And because he does that, there is hope. There's hope for transformation within our world. And we so desperately need to have that kind of hope as we walk and as we live as the people of God today. Uh, the people of Nineveh experience hope as that has happened. They have hope that they're not going to be destroyed as time has gone by. And we can share hope with our world as we live and walk as a people of God today. We live in the midst of a time when there's just a lot of challenges going on. You know, the shooting in Buffalo a week or so ago, politics all up in the air, elections uh, going on, and we wonder how things are going to turn out as the year goes along. The war in Ukraine is on our minds. Um, abortion uh, ruling from the Supreme Court, and what's that going to mean um, for people, for individuals, for laws within individual states, and just all of those things become a part of our conversations with one another. But in the midst of all that, he calls us to be a place a community of people that know him, that love him, and are able to live that out into this world to show his design, to show his grace, and to bring hope in the midst of a world that so often doesn't have any hope. And that's what he calls and enables us to do as his people. That's the, the challenge that he puts to us. Our Lord Jesus Christ gave up his life, died in order that our sins might be forgiven, demonstrating his great love for people. And then he sends us out into the world with that same good news. The mission that he has given to us is to cross boundaries in Jesus' love, to meet needs, build relationships, and make disciples. Jonah gives us a pattern, a model for it, shows us what's on the heart of God because God has his servants, his cities, and God has his word. And we get to have the opportunity to bring those all together in ways that bring honor and glory to him. Let's live faithfully as God's people in this place and time. Let us pray. Lord God, we give you thanks that you made your love tangible in this world in a way that demonstrates your power and your love. And we thank you that we get to have the opportunity to live into that in tangible and concrete ways. And Lord, we... We sometimes wonder how we go about doing that. In the midst of all of the challenges that we see around us in our world today, we, we want to know how to, how to live out your love in a way that's going to make a difference. And how to bring wisdom. And how to bring peace. And how to bring wholeness. How to bring hope. And so we ask that as we seek you together, as we follow you together, as we live together in community, that you might give us wisdom and grace and understanding for living that out day by day. We pray that, that we might be a part of the ways in which you want to build your kingdom here, that we might live into what you have in mind for the, the Central Park community, for the Holland community, for this part of Michigan, in all the places where we are and the things that we do. May we bring honor and glory to you in order that there might be transformation and hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand a second. Build your kingdom here. So build your kingdom here and let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand and heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire and win this nation back and change the your kingdom here we pray set your rule and reign in our hearts 
Go forth to live as the people of God in all the places where he sends you in this week. And remember that you never go alone. Because you go with the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the eternal fellowship of the Holy Spirit, today, tomorrow, and always. Amen. Amen. Amen.